Support for the podcast comes from Open Minds Psychological with locations in Plymouth Meeting and Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Open Minds works with individuals to support needs around emotional regulation, anxiety, depression, trauma, and coping skill development. They also offer psychological evaluations to assess developmental, cognitive, academic, and behavioral needs, high-risk assessment, as well as career counseling. Evidence-informed group therapy options are offered periodically throughout the year around topics such as anxiety awareness and skill building, social skill development, ADHD and executive function coaching, as well as parent support groups. Learn more at openmindpsychological.com. Hello, hello, and welcome back to Parenting Stuff I Wish I Knew Sooner and Want You to Know Now. I'm your host, Erica Desper, founder of the Center for Confident Parenting and a mom who seemed to learn everything I needed to know just the hardest way. My guest today is Dr. Stephanie Fields. She's first and foremost a mom of two adult children, also a family therapist and parent coach who's both a licensed psychologist and certified school psychologist and has earned a master's degree in human development and a doctorate in clinical development psychology. Dr. Fields also trained at the ADHD clinic at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She works with families and children ages four to 12 to address anxiety, and behavioral challenges, helping parents know when to step in and when to step back to raise resilient children. I love that. Dr. Stephanie, thank you for joining me. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. Uh, and I'm so impressed with all of your, you know, your credentials. <laughs> I have a little bit of imposter syndrome. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. Uh, happy to have you. So first of all, tell us a little bit about you and how did you land in this work of, of helping families? Um, I started, you know, I went to college with in psychology and wasn't really enjoying it that much. And then I took a class that was a developmental psychology class about kids. And I thought, wow, this is so much fun. Um, I love working with kids. This would be a great career. And I just also felt that it was a very hopeful career that, you know, differences that you make early on in a child's life make a huge difference in their development and how they feel about themselves and, and really for them to enjoy and really benefit from their childhoods. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it just kind of, uh, it fell into your lap. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess I just really like kids. <laughs> yeah, and, you kind of um, have to if you're going to work with them or they'll make you crazy. <laughs> I just think they're so fun and they're interesting. Yes. And I just really enjoy working with kids. I read children's literature for fun. I just <laughs> like being in a kid's head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and then, of course, when we like working with kids, we often end up working with the parents of the kids. So I know that's, that's mainly... Um, what you're doing. Um, so what, what scenarios are families most often coming to you for help with? So mostly I'm seeing families where they have concerns with their children having anxiety. So either lots of worries or inability to do certain tasks that they should be able to do because of worries and resistance and sometimes meltdowns and tantrums because of that. And then I also see families where there are behavior problems, where mm -hmm. um, the child's having tantrums or meltdowns, they're not listening, they are hitting family members, things like that. Got it. Which can be, behavior can be driven by anxiety, right? It can kind of... It can be. It's not always, but yeah. yes, it absolutely can be. Okay. Like, you so know, we're... there's always a component. That's the thing. It, it, right. it, there, we're not ever just doing one thing. Everything's right. interrelated. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, so we're going to focus on the anxiety piece today, and that is near and dear to my heart because I am an adult in therapy for, <laughs> for anxiety. Oh. I am medicated. Um, each of okay, us in great. our family. Good for is, you for getting treatment right? and addressing it. Yes. It was a long time coming. I've joked on previous recordings about how I thought I was a really punctual person my whole life, and I prided myself on that. And then I got medicated for my anxiety, and it turned out I was not a punctual person. I was a person who was anxious about being late. <laughs> And now I'm like a little late for everything. <laughs> How interesting. How interesting. Uh, and I just go like, you know, the sky's not going to fall. I'll give them a heads up. They will wait for me. Like it's, which is actually a relief. And I'm like, oh, but my punctuality was one of my favorite <laughs> qualities, but not if it's being driven by anxiety. <laughs> exactly. But I think that people need to remember that we have anxiety for a reason. It's an emotion that we have 
that it protects us from dangerous things. And so, no, the sky will not fall if you're late. But sometimes anxiety about things really does help us keep safe. So it's an important emotion to have. <laughs> yes, it is not all bad. That's for sure. Right. So, And then I'm also the mother of a very, very anxious kiddo. We oh. finally got a diagnosis for him of anxiety. And along with that, um, OCD, which I just thought I was attributing it to really significant anxiety, but I guess it qualifies as OCD. So this is something that we have really struggled with. Um, and his anxiety can be generalized. He can just be mm -hmm. anxious about everything, or it can be highly specific. Like in summer, it's about bees. Right now, it's apparently about elevators, which was news to me. I don't know where that came from. Um, so I guess my next question for you is how might a parent know if their child is like, well, this is just age-related anxiety. They go through things about separation and things about, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, versus like they're overly anxious and maybe we need a professional to step in and help. I found that I think parents are really a good, good judges of sort of what's more in the typical range and what's kind of out of the typical range. And so it's actually typical for children to have about on average five to seven fears or worries. So that's normal okay. to have five to seven fears or worries. That's and absolutely any given time. Yep. Yep. Okay. That's, that's, that's good normal. To know. That's typical. Yep. And so when we're getting outside of that, but really more as professionals, we're looking at and parents should be looking at is it interfering with their functioning in some way? So yeah. for children who are afraid of bees, if they're not going outside to play in the summer, then that's a big interference with their regular functioning. They can't go on play dates if they can't go to the pool because they're afraid of bees, then that's really interfering with their functioning in life. So that's often what we look for in terms of being the, the line for you should really seek help if it's interfering with their functioning. Absolutely. I agree. And we had some, some very good examples of that. Um, for example, he, there was a period of time when he was much younger where he wouldn't go to the second floor of our house by himself. <laughs> it was really kind of ruining our lives yes. um, because we had a multi-level home and a lot had to yes. happen on the second floor and I couldn't always go with him. And I didn't think it was maybe helpful to always go with him. Yes. Um, and we worked through that with a lot of baby steps. Um, and and like it's so said, challenging. And I will so say many, many people have <sighs> that. And frankly, I I actually still think that that's within the normal range because okay. it is so common. so, so common. It really is problematic for families, but yeah. it is so common. And to really work on it in therapy is actually very hard. The therapeutic yeah. interventions are, they take forever. They're a ton of work, but yep. sometimes you could do it an easy way. Like you send a sibling up. You send the dog up. You let them carry the cat up. Sometimes that works. You would be surprised oh, what works. Yeah. A lot of times, even younger sisters, two-year-olds, if they accompany yeah. a seven-year-old, the seven-year-old's okay. And a yeah. lot of times, they're willing to do that. So that's that's a very yeah. challenging one that a lot of families actually have. Yeah. Well, so I'll tell you what you did, and you I'm throwing at this at you spontaneously, but you tell me if this is like an approved <laughs> method, right? Yeah. We, when I say we took baby steps, I mean that literally. I'd be like, okay, you don't want to go upstairs by yourself. Can, can you go to the second step by yourself? Yeah. And I'll stand right here on the landing. And we kind of like, okay, well, you did great. So how about, can you go to like the middle of the yes. staircase? And we worked up to like, he'd be at the top and he could see me at the bottom. And then I'd say, okay, you know, walk to the bathroom because you need to go to the bathroom. I'll stay here. You'll hear my voice. Um, it was painful and it was exhausting it and then he needed it that is. every single time it's for a so while so much work it is so much work but it did eventually work and i could just say like okay Good go to you. the top step i'll be at the bottom so is that like if Good the parents you. up for that <laughs> yes absolutely That's something they or do. you can also like so you could do practice sessions where you like stick yeah. some candies or some <laughs> coins nickels and dimes <laughs> yep and you say go up and right. do a treasure hunt and, yeah. and then you can move them farther away or you make the right. quarters farther. So they've got to go all the way to their bed to get a quarter. You know, you could do that kind of thing. Um, and yeah, that is it's, agonizing it's, for parents, I realize. Um, and not so every kid work. maybe needs that many baby steps. Um, but it does. I always say to parents when I'm coaching, like if, if you're at the park and they're trying to reach the ladder to get up the, the play apparatus, if they can't reach that first rung, they're not getting up the ladder. So sometimes do you feel like we have to just bring that rung 
absolutely down or add absolutely one. you always need to start where the kids are and move from there it does not matter where they are there's no judgment where they are as long as children are making progress and moving forward that's your goal yeah okay so you listed some scenarios like they can't play if it's affecting their play which is their main occupation as kids right mm -hmm. <laughs> want to get some help um you also listed maybe won't talk at school um what, what can we do like what can we practice for that while we're on the topic of practice? <laughs> How could if we someone practice? doesn't talk in school, it's I would seek professional help right it away. So okay. yes, yeah, that, so. that's very important to seek uh, professional help right away. If someone's not talking in a particular situation, if they're mm -hmm. chatty at home and then they go to school and they don't talk, mm -hmm. that's an issue. Yeah. And again, and for younger children, you can expect the first month or two, they might yeah. talk less, but they should be saying their name or just doing some little talking but some children just won't talk at all. That yep. is um, a cause for getting professional help right away. Okay, excellent. And the one that I see most often related to anxiety is that they cannot sleep or will not sleep independently. Absolutely. Um, so that is probably something that you're helping families with. Absolutely. So actually I found that they're actually related to each other, that mm -hmm. when you get sleep in order, anxiety goes down significantly mm. and children who are anxious about a number of things um parents don't even parents hardly ever bring to me the concern about sleep they bring to me another concern and when then when i interview them sleep is an issue when we address sleep often the anxieties are reduced significantly in all the other areas Right. Of course. Yes. And we just did a recording about the importance of sleep and the effects of being underslept. So if you're doubtful about that, go check that one out. <laughs> it's not um, only that. It's actually, it's not about the amount, actually. In this case, it's about sleeping independently, learning to sleep without a parent in the room, hoping. without a parent lying down next to you. It's a huge, it makes a huge difference whether they do or they don't. You can see it in the child's face. The first mm -hmm. morning they do it independently, um, you could see a difference. I mean, it's really stark. Yes. Okay. Awesome. And then you mentioned, obviously get professional help. If a lot of this is about what, if, how is it affecting the child? So mm -hmm. not just their activities, but like, do you feel like they're suffering or do you feel like they're yes. coping? Right? Yes. So if a child is suffering, any child that's suffering, parents should get help for. Sure. <laughs> right. So or I would say if the parent is suffering. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> if a parent doesn't feel like they know what to do, uh, then they should get help for that. And you yeah. can start by looking online and getting some ideas and trying some easy stuff. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure parents all do that. But then, uh, yes, get some help for it. Because again, it'll just, it helps everything in the family. It helps the whole family. Because this yeah. child actually, if there's other siblings, isn't only affecting their relationship with their parent, but it's also the whole family uh, climate. Absolutely. When a child's having a struggle. You mentioned to me in advance that sometimes very anxious children end up making a lot of rules and restrictions that the family has to abide by. Can you, yes. so that's what's not, going on there? And should yes. we abide? <laughs> so symptoms of anxiety aren't only that a child has fears and worries. Sometimes they'll have meltdowns. So anxiety is really, uh, the way anxiety works is through avoidance. So you feel anxious and then the way it works in our brains is to avoid that thing that makes you anxious. So right. children will go to great lengths and anybody will really who's anxious will go to great lengths to avoid the thing that makes them anxious. So in children's case, um, it could just be avoidance where they'll just refuse to do something or mm -hmm. they might have a tantrum or a meltdown. So we have many tantrums and meltdowns before bedtime or before mm -hmm. going to school or when a parent's leaving the house, something like that. Um, and I forgot the other part of the question that you asked me. Um, why would they make the rules and restrictions? Oh, the rules and what restrictions. What does that do for them? So that is, again, they're, they're kind of rigid. Mm -hmm. They're kind of rigid and nervous. They're, so anxiety also, by, by having us avoid things, makes an anxious person's world very small. Mm -hmm. because they avoid something that lowers their anxiety. They think, oh, hey, this really worked for me. I don't feel mm -hmm. anxious when I avoid. So, mm -hmm. oh, this other thing that's new out there, um, that I'm feeling a little anxious. I'm going to avoid that too. Oh, hey, that's really working for me. I'm not feeling anxious now. So mm -hmm. it's it, you get anxiety, it works through avoidance, and then it makes someone's world very, very small. And mm -hmm. so kids who are anxious, 
they feel like they can't do certain things. No, I can't do that. They make all sorts of rules. We have to eat this. We have to do this. And parents are just trying to do the right thing. And they think that they are listening to their child and doing the appropriate thing. And so they listen. And then you hear all the rules and all the kind of cartwheels the parents have to do in order to make things work in their house. And that's the child's anxiety that needs to be addressed. So that's right, another right, symptom. Right. Okay. And I assume a parent could perceive that as I just have a really strong willed controlling yes. child, but maybe we need to look at it through the lens of it's yes. actually avoidance that's yes. kind of dressed up as, or it's uh, anxiety dressed up as avoidance, control, rigidity. Yes. It looks like rigidity. It looks like demanding. It looks like, um, yes, all that stuff. Okay. Um, so that brings me to my next question of what other behaviors, challenges, issues can be, have the root cause of anxiety be triggered by anxiety or driven by it, but look like something else, or did we just cover them all? Yeah, we pretty much covered it. But most of the thing that looks like other things is the tantrums and the meltdowns. Behavior. What parents um, would typically consider like bad, unwanted behavior. Yes. That's sort mm -hmm. of in the behavior category, but sometimes it really is anxiety. Right. Um, sometimes right. yelling, arguing back, sometimes hitting things like that. They're really just inside frightened and anxious and, and they're very fearful. And so they're lashing out just to sort of make things happen the way they need it to happen. Right. So we're maybe just seeing the tip of the iceberg, but underneath mm -hmm. they're anxious about something. <laughs> and of course that's going to drive, correct me if I'm wrong, our strategies, because if we're treating it as bad behavior with a punishment, but it's actually driven by anxiety, that's probably not going to yield. We're just not on the right track. <laughs> right, exactly. So we want to, I guess the takeaway for parents is we want to get curious about what's actually happening underneath so we can have the right strategy to address it. Yes, but actually some of my strategies have to do with just having things set up in the household ahead of time, sort of beforehand mm -hmm. to kind of preclude that from happening to sort of really keep us on a good track that when children start veering, you kind of know what the track is. Yeah. And most of us are so busy and many of our listeners have, you know, multiple kids and maybe they work outside the home and all sorts yes. of activities. So yes. I think the pattern we fall into is that as parents, we're typically reacting to these scenarios. But what you're talking about is sort of noticing when they happen, where they happen, why they happen, and being a little more proactive. You know, there's going to be a separation coming at 9 a.m. What can we, you know, set up in advance? And like we said at the outset, it does take more time, more energy, more thought. But the trade-off is that maybe you avoid the meltdown and the drama and then you get that time back. Right? Absolutely. It's an investment. I, yeah. I, I always see it as an investment. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes parents do not have the bandwidth to address something. So morning routine is horrible, but they don't have the bandwidth at that moment to really address it. And when they get the bandwidth or when they're determined that they're going to devote some bandwidth to this, to, 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 to do it, then they can invest the time and energy in doing it and creating new habits so that then ultimately they're using less bandwidth than they had before in managing that issue. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Uh, so what can we as parents do to build a really nice, strong foundation for mental health, you know, early on? And I guess you can tell us how early on are we starting? Yeah. Um, and particularly with respect to anxiety. Absolutely. So I am very concerned mental health professionals are very concerned about the teen and young adult crisis, mental health crisis regarding anxiety and depression, which are kind of actually very closely related to each other. Yeah. And I do feel that we can set the foundation for children, just from what I see coming through my office, that we can set a nice foundation for children to kind of help them develop resilience at a young age, that then they'll be in better shape when they reach their teen and young adult years. And so I feel very strongly that in the home, children should have age-appropriate expectations for their own self-care. This mm -hmm. doesn't even sound like a mental health thing, actually, but right. I have found in my work that when I address it with kids who have behavior problems or anxiety, they just look so good. They mm -hmm. just, 
they just look so good. And parents are like, wow, they just, they look so good. They look mature. They seem more settled. And these things are not that hard. Many families do them already, but I found in the families that they don't, you know, these kids are coming in for, for help. And so let me give you some examples of the kinds of things when a family's coming in with a child that's anxious. And I do an interview about what their day looks like. I look at a number of different areas. So I look at the morning routine. And so, and it should be age appropriate, but actually kids can do a lot of these things at a pretty young age. So, um, picking out their own clothes, actually preschoolers can do this. They can, and they love to, and it's kind of funny when they do. Um, picking out their own clothes. If you can live with the results of it, if they're not your your style. The issue is more the parents (laughs) than the kids. You know, a kid will walk in one day and the teacher will say, oh, I see you dressed yourself. Right? And And the cowboy boots in the summer. And they're like, yes, I did. You know, they're so proud of themselves. And that's what we're looking for. This pride, this confidence, this kind of Mm. self-efficacy, self-efficacy, sort of being in charge of their own decision making. Mm-hmm. That and being able to get stuff done in the world. And so when they get stuff done regarding their own self-care, they actually feel very good about themselves. Mm-hmm. So uh, getting dressed in the morning, uh, coming down for breakfast and then getting out of the house and then sitting at mealtime with the family, not watching TV or on a screen, but sitting at mealtime, I think is an important milestone. Their self-care in terms of their hygiene. So washing their bodies in the bath. So even a two-year-old can start to be washing their body. Because you, you can know, always follow up and make sure it's I mean, they're sitting thorough. in the tub. How dirty are they? Yeah. Yes. But yes, <laughs> you can follow up. And you can coach them. So really, I like parents to coach as much verbally as possible. You mm. coach them. If they can't do it, you're right there. Then you put your hands in. But you wait till they get stuck. And you say, okay, I'll give you this bit of help. Same with getting dressed. You know, kids, oh, I can't get dressed. Okay, get dressed until you get stuck. I'm right here. I'll help you. Mm -hmm. And so when they get stuck, and that's parents' job is actually to teach and help. Okay, so when your pants are stuck like this, try doing this. Or Mm -hmm. this is a way to lay out your pants so you get them on the right way. Or your shirt. And then half doesn't put them on backwards anyway. It doesn't (laughs) matter. Um, and I'm surprised. So we help with potty training as well. And a a high percentage of these um, two, three, sometimes even four-year-olds, they get stuck, not because they don't understand the process, but they have trouble with manipulating their clothing, which is like yes. a really key, it cuts into the time you have to get there and get it where it needs to go. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think we're, a lot of us are missing these steps. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm sometimes surprised that, and again, your parents have such a hard life. I mean, they're busy to trying to get out in the morning. There's two people trying to get out. Usually two parents or whoever's taking care of the kids, they're usually going to a job. They've got to get one or more children ready, everybody on time. Kids don't want to, you know, kids don't have that same time pressure. It's very challenging. That's the trap, I think, is it's, again, it's like a reverse. uh, You're going to have to slow down and be patient and be tolerant. They're not going to probably get themselves dressed as quickly as you would get them dressed. And we feel this pressure of like, it's just faster if I put the clothes on the hamper rather than call them back and show them, you know. um, Exactly. That is true. Think we can strike a balance of, I always tell parents with a new habit, like aim for once a day. If they can put their own pants on once a day, maybe it's not during the morning rush. Maybe it's the pajama pants at the end of the day. Right. At least we're like, we're getting there, right? Right. Um, and depending how old they are. I mean, at seven, they should be putting on their own pants. Yes, all the time. <laughs> and so that's a thing. When, when it's really clear they should be doing it, it, it should just be, you can do this. You need to do it. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times they just do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And so I'm just going to move a little bit through some of the other things. So bathing, showering, doing some of their own hair. A lot of times when they do some of their own hair, they are able to. And so the thing is, parents aren't just leaving this for kids to do. They're doing it with them. They're teaching them. They're coaching them. They're modeling. How are we going to manage not getting water in your eyes? You know, Mm -hmm. what strategies are we going to use in our family? Some kids lie down in the bath to just get their head to rinse their hair off. Some right. kids will hold a washcloth over their eyes. There's all sorts of different strategies. And so that's what parents are doing when they're teaching and coaching. They're watching. They're seeing where does this child get stuck? And how do, how do I teach them to do this? You know, what do I do? Well, when I do it, this is how I do it. How do you know you're, you have no soap in your hair? Well, when I do it, I see if my hair squeaks. You know, you have, how do they, they don't know that until you teach right. them. So. Right, right. All those things, um, wiping themselves. You know, I have elementary school kids who actually don't wipe themselves yet. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and you would be surprised. They don't want to do it, but they're proud of themselves when they do. 
They felt like it was something they couldn't do, but then when they can do it, they feel really good about themselves. And not like they're going to go brag about it, but there's just this inner (laughs) kind of confidence that they're taking care of their own bodies. And that's kind of nice. Um, And then independent sleep is really kind of the kicker. That's actually the hardest, um, but it really makes such a big difference in how kids feel about themselves. And I just want to stress to the parent out there that's like, yeah, maybe for other kids that my kid so anxious, independent sleep is just, you know, not possible right now or not in our future. Like anxious kids can learn to sleep independently. Sometimes it does require baby steps like we talked about before. Um, but is that, like, do you agree with that? There isn't like a measure of anxiety where we couldn't nope, work Absolutely. Because really I see such a decrease in the anxiety when they can sleep on their own. So when they sleep on their own, it's practically a cure for a lot of kids. And that's what we're looking for. However, we don't start with sleep. We start with the other things. So if they're not wiping themselves, they learn how to wipe themselves. If they're not dressing themselves, they do that. If they're not clearing their plate from the table, they start doing that. And so these things very quickly give them, give kids the idea that, oh, I can do these things that are age appropriate. Right. And then, you know, there's some care that needs to happen with the sleep. It's just not, uh, let's try this. It needs to be done well, but when it's done well, it's very manageable. Right. And as the parent of a child who has anxiety across the ages and sleep has always been, um, one of the ways that it manifests, um, I know it's easy for parents to say to themselves, but they're scared. Um, and kind of use that as a I don't want to use the word excuse, but as a reason that they can't work toward independent sleep. And I'm a big fan of telling parents like there two things can be true. (laughs) Yes, they are scared and we can learn to cope with that and still learn to sleep independently because what if they're scared for the rest of their life, right? Like there's going to be all these phases. If they're going to have five to seven fears at a time, you might never, ever get to independent sleep and kids who can't learn to sleep independently often turn into adults who rely on the TV or, you know, some sort of technology to sleep, yes. which impacts the quality and so on and so on. So it's yes. not necessarily something we will grow out of, um, right. but it is more, it's the type of fear that needs to be worked through versus yes. worked out of based on age. Right. But I think it can be challenged a little bit too. So a parent can sit, feel badly for the child for feeling afraid, but I say to parents, are you afraid in your house? Mm-hmm. Do you feel that your house is safe? Are you worried for your child? Do you think something's going to happen for them? And I tell kids, your parents are in charge of your safety. They make you wear a seatbelt. They make you wear a bike helmet. They Do they let you do anything that's not safe? And parents do not let kids do stuff that's not safe these days. And they're like, no. Do you think they would let you sleep in their room if they didn't think you were safe? That's their job to make sure. So your parents don't think there's any reason to be scared. You're safe. So you know, I think it's important to set that up too, that they're, they're allowed to be scared, but their parents actually are not scared for them. And their parents are the ones in charge of their safety. And, Mm -hmm. and I think that that's kind of an important way to think about it. And then also, I think it's important to give kids a lot of strategies to manage that fear. Yeah, exactly. That's, I think that's the way to bring those two things together. It's like, yes, you're scared and we want to move towards independent sleep. So what are the strategies that we can use to talk back to your worries and, you know, make sure that we're all safe and all of that. Let me throw another question at you that I did not prepare you for. If a child is saying something very specific, let's say at bedtime, or again, I'll use my son as an example. Are all the doors are locked, right? Yep. All the doors are locked. Okay. What about the front door? Yep. Front door. (laughs) What about the back door? Yep. Back door. What about the first floor windows? He gets really into it. Right. And I'm sure that's the OCD. Um, And we'll talk about, like you said, how the house is safe and the doors are locked and he's on the second floor and our neighborhood is safe and all of that. But what if they throw something super specific at you? Like, well, someone could put a ladder against the house and climb up to my (laughs) window. Like when they take it there, what do we say? Like, I can't say to him that won't happen. Right. That's silly. (laughs) It could happen. So how do we speak to the fears that are legit and an older child's aware enough to know this could happen. <laughs> right. Well, that's the thing about anxiety. We do have it because there is some possibility that these things can happen. So you right. can get stung by a bee. So you right. can have a break in. There are house fires. Stuff happens in this life. And, and you know, you can't ever say, sweetheart, I can't promise you it's not going to happen. But right. it is highly unlikely to happen. We have lived here your entire life. Right. I have lived my entire life of all of my years. And I've never had a house fire. Not going right. on. Not going <laughs> 
<laughs> right? They do happen. And we do this and this and this in case it happens. So if it happens, this is what we would do. But remember, we have a dog, we have house locks. And you could say, you know, this is true for me. I asked the police and they said that it's so unusual that they'll, they'll find a house where the door is unlocked or the windows unlocked rather than get a ladder. Because right. people would see them and they'd get caught and right. we have good police here and mom and dad is here and it's just not likely to happen. Yes, this could happen, you know, but it's really not likely and I'm not worried about it. And so it's just not worth it. Okay. We need to live our lives. So it sounds like we always do this thing called, you know, possible, not probable. Like, is it yes. possible yes. that could happen? Yes, I can't promise you. But the probability is so low based on da 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 da, da which you just said. And then yes. the third P would be, and we've prepared for that by yes. whatever, having an exit plan or having an alarm system or whatever. Yes. So yes. Focus, focus on the three P's, <laughs> possible, yes. probable, and preparation. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, and even for the worst one, which is, you know, what if something happens to you, my parents, and mm -hmm. you, you let them know it is not likely I do all these things to be healthy and safe. I wear my seatbelt. I go to the doctor. I do everything I can, but stuff happens. If anything happens to me, this is who is going to watch you. Right, right, right. That right. tends, they stop, they tend to not ask again. Once and you we tell don't... them what the plan is, once right. they know there's a plan, it really seems to help um, okay. alleviate a lot of that anxiety. And just to clarify what we would not want to say, we don't want to sugarcoat it and be like, oh, that can't happen, even if they're really young. <laughs> we don't want to promise no. something that's not possible because that won't help the anxiety, right? Oh, right, yeah. My children yeah. lost their father. Mm. He got sick. Yeah. It happens. This is why yeah. we see people get sick. Things happen. Right. And, and then we run the risk responses. that they won't trust our dialogue because Absolutely. Like, well, I know someone who lost their parents, so I know it's possible. And now I don't believe you. So yeah, it is. This is life. Keep it honest. Yes. Yeah. This is life. Yes. But we All can't right. spend all our time in worrying about this because then we're not going to have fun. We need right. to have fun. We need to enjoy our lives. The stuff is going to happen, but we need to enjoy our lives while we're here. Yeah. All right, great. So let's step back a bit to the self-efficacy and the daily tasks that are, you know, reasonable expectations for our kids that we should have them doing. Um, a lot, my son is neurodivergent. I know a lot of our listeners have kids who are neurodivergent. So if your child is, do your strategies then as a parent need to, with respect to anxiety or efficacy, do those strategies need to change? Do our I think, expectations that, I think the goal is still the same because these kids will still feel good about themselves the more they can do. And frankly, they need it more because they have other struggles in their lives. So if they're able to care for themselves, it actually is very powerful for them. And, and you really want that. Often I found that they tend to need executive functioning support to get some of this stuff done. And so this is not, you know, these are not rocket science interventions. It's just regular executive functioning. Normally these kids can do all these tasks. And so they'll might need, you know, some reminders. I don't think that's the end of the world. Sometimes let's say a little chart or a list if they don't remember their morning routine or even for younger ones, what, what do you need to get dressed? What are all the clothing items or what's the order of the clothing items? You know, a little list that's posted in their room is certainly helpful or what do they need to do in the bathroom? That kind of thing. That's helpful. Um, some kids with real, you know, attention issues are very distractible, can use a support like doing like getting dressed in the same room as someone else you know right. either in the same room where the parent is or some kids bring their clothes down to wherever the parents doing their morning jobs making breakfast something like that and they just get dressed there mm -hmm. because they just are too distractible to get dressed on their own so that's more of an attention issue and that mm -hmm. can help the morning routine go smoother so things like that um can be really helpful yeah and i have found I feel like scaffolding is such a buzzword right now, but as the parent of a neurodivergent kid, I found that we need a lot of scaffolding when we're working through a routine, like the shower and after shower steps of teeth and, you know, all of that. Um, they just, he needs a lot of repetition and he does need a visual, but then eventually, and it takes longer than I wish and really longer than I can sometimes tolerate, um, he does eventually take that over on his own. So yeah. I just want parents to know that it, it may last longer than you wish it would, but those things, you can eventually remove those supports. That's something we do in the morning that has helped with, all, you know, he needs to take his allergy spray and his yeah. um, 
ADHD pill and brush his hair and now he's old enough he needs to put on deodorant that's a, already a lot of steps for someone who doesn't wake up very well or easily and isn't really interested in going to school that day so we're already starting on the wrong foot so we have a little um we call it the caddy it's a little basket from the dollar store and everything he needs for his morning routine is in that basket including a toothbrush and toothpaste in case he forgot to brush before he came down because he gets really agitated if i send him back up so all i have to say now is have you done your caddy or hey what do you need to do to be ready and he knows that the caddy. that's so, so perfect it, it takes like five things and puts them into one and i feel like that's not a crutch necessarily it's more of a tool because he could do that for himself as an adult that lives outside the house i have everything for the morning here in one spot um, exactly. So is that an these, example of what these are the about? fabulous example, and it's great because it's great for them to be learning now. What do they need to do to be successful? And it's not a crutch; it's a support, it's a strategy, it's a um. There's another word that I can't think of. It's a <laughs> it, it's a compensatory strategy. Accommodation. It's great. <laughs> yeah, but but that's fine. I mean, like yeah. like a lot of us do this kind of stuff. This is just normal, like like living with our own yes. brains, and so in a very complicated world. So. Yeah, it's great that they're learning how to live with their own brains now. And again, the nice thing about some a support like that is that you don't always have to be there. You can say, how are you doing on your caddy? Or where right. are you on your list? A lot of these kids do like to check stuff off. So yes. checking stuff off can be nice. Um, but they do forget stuff. And I know it's really valuable in terms of executive function to ask them a question that they have to think through versus say like, do your caddy. Are you done your caddy? It's a very small shift to say, where are you on your caddy? Or what else mm -hmm. needs to happen to be ready to walk out the door? I used to say, socks and shoes, socks and shoes, socks and shoes, <laughs> put your so socks and shoes right, on right. and drive myself nuts. And now I look at him and say, all right, we're walking out the door in two minutes. Are you ready to walk out the door? And he goes, yeah. You know, and then he look, looks around and goes, oh, I don't have any shoes on. <laughs> um, and it's funny and it's agitating. Um, but I feel like that will move him forward more than me just saying. Absolutely. Choose, 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 right? Absolutely. Yeah. It's having, so you're very slowly transferring the responsibility to him. And so right. with these kids, it takes longer. With every child, you're transferring this responsibility from you caring for them to them caring for them. And it goes at different paces. But again, as long as they're making progress, the rate is really not the important thing. Right. And I've also learned to drop my expectations, and I don't mean this in a negative way, but when your child has a developmental delay, you may be working on tasks that a much younger child, yes. we would expect to have already mastered because it's just gonna take them longer to yes. get there. And that is not necessarily a bad thing. That's what a delay is. Yeah. And once we catch up, we're caught up. <laughs> yeah. um, so I used to feel bad that we were still working on like the evening routine or whatever, but I've made, you know, I've made peace with it. We'll still get there. Yeah. Um, there's one other thing I wanted to circle back too, when you gave the example of, you know, let your child pick out their clothes for the morning, which is an excellent one. And some kids would get excited and would be really successful. I also work with a lot of kids who get overloaded from the volume of choices. So if looking into a drawer of shirts and leggings is, is like too much, um, like we often will suggest that our parents give limited choices or you know, do you want to wear the pink outfit or the purple outfit or whatever? Like, how would you, what would your strategy be for a kid who were trying to give them choice um, <laughs> and control, but they like can't handle it? <laughs> Absolutely. So some kids can't, but um, it's also a job that needs to be done. And so just because it's challenging for them doesn't mean that they still shouldn't do it. So okay. Again, you can work, every child is different and you can work that out. You could just say, just pick the one on top. Hmm. Like really, who cares? Pick yeah. the one on top okay. and then find a shirt that you think that you like to, that goes with it. Or just say, start with pants, pick a pair of pants you want to wear and then do do a shirt. Um, yeah. So one thing I did with my kids, I don't really recommend it for very many of my clients, but <laughs> with my kids, I gave them choices, but then I just did not have all day to wait for them. Uh, I just didn't want to wait. And so I gave them a choice and I would say, okay, which one do you want? And then I would say one, mm. two, three. And if they hadn't picked by three, I would just pick. Yeah. Now, I'm not mad. They right. could pick the next time. Uh, but sometimes actually they were just a little bit relieved that they didn't have to pick. Right. You know, sometimes it's a little bit much. We have so many choices. We really have too many choices in our world. We're so, it's a, it's a luxury, but it's a little bit of a burden too, to have so many choices. Yeah, exactly. And so sometimes I would just count and they never argued with me about it. 
Right. And I think that brings this all back to like, why can it be helpful to bring in a professional to look at everything and give you strategies is that every child, every human is so individual. So we can throw strategies out for days, but how that how your child processes that it could backfire, it could, you know, make things worse. Um, and it's just hard as a parent of one or several children to know of all the available strategies that you could use and measure, you know, how well that works. So I think that's where, you know, having a coach or someone to say like, Ooh, in learning about your child, their temperament, their personality, I think this, you know, cause it sounds like even with your own, you know, there wasn't one strategy that worked every morning or for both of them. <laughs> oh, oh, both of my children were very different. And so I used, had to use different strategies for each one of them. Yeah. Um, and the other thing Which is almost that, doubles our parenting job, right? Or triples or however many I kids I say you have. it expands your parenting skills. Yes, that's a, good, that's uh, a better way to say it. Expands your... Well, and it's kind of interesting in that way. Builds that that you do tool. develop other skills. It expands your repertoire. The other thing is though, that every parent comes with their own skills and preferences. So it's not only the child. But it's the parent too. Um, what they bring to the table, you just have to understand that the parents can't can still be themselves. They don't have to yeah. be a different person. Sometimes, you know, our children do require that we move out of our comfort zone sometimes, and that's something that we we can do sometimes for them. Yeah. But but we still are who we are. Like I'm, I am not someone who can wait forever for my kid to make a decision. I just right. it just doesn't feel good to me. And so I right. need to listen to that and, and figure out a way to move it forward. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. All right. This has been fabulous. I have one more question for you. We'll sure. have you back in the future. We'll focus more on behavioral challenges. What is one thing that you have learned on your journey, whether it be parenting, supporting parents, what have you, that we haven't touched on yet that you would like other parents to hear and to know today? Uh, so I just one point I want to make about uh, parenting today is that what I'm hearing now is that parents are feeling a lot of mom guilt. Mom guilt is the thing that I hear the most. And I feel so badly for parents that this is how they're feeling because I know how hard they're working and how much they're investing of themselves in this role. And so uh, in psychology, what we think healthy children need is only good enough parenting good enough. That's a very low bar and you can still have healthy children with this very low bar of good enough parenting. So I'm hoping that we can start to re-educate parents to some degree and be kinder and not have them feel guilty about things that they are or aren't doing because I am sure that they're doing at least good enough, but probably an excellent job. Yeah. And what, what is good enough parenting? What does that mean to you? It's obviously not perfect. We're not aiming for perfection. It's not perfect. So um, I don't think, for example, parents need to accommodate every single one of their child's wishes. Like, I don't think they have to feed them different food at night. I don't think that that is better for them. I think that kids can figure out or parents can figure out what part of the meal the child can eat and only make one dinner. So to me, that's good enough. Actually, I think it's actually better, healthier for the child and for the family. Um, what else is good enough? Uh, you know, again, letting ch children fail. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's okay. Not, not horribly. Not rushing Be in to rescue. Being there if to support them. But yes, letting them experience some of the consequences of their behaviors, but also letting them make decisions on their own, which they like you know, sort of informing them ahead of time. Okay. These are the trade-offs of this decision. Um, try it now. If it doesn't work out, it's not the end of the world. You'll try again next time kind of thing and have them. And I think it's helpful to talk them out ahead of time, but to then allow them to experience the consequences of their decisions. Like, you know, forgetting their lunch at school, like really what's the worst that's going to happen. Someone's going to give them some pretzels, something like that, but um, they will learn to not forget their lunch and you're not running out to bring their lunch into school. The, the lesson that's learned is so much more powerful, but then people are like, Oh, I can't believe you let them go without lunch. <laughs> You know, you, you have to sort of, you have to a little bit be strong with what you believe is best for your child. Yeah. And you have a wish for parents as well about how they feel about their parenting that ties into this good enough. Parenting. I just want them to feel good about themselves as parents, that they should feel good about themselves as parents. I know how devoted parents are and invested parents are, and also how 
hard our particular society makes for us to have these children, to raise them in the way that we really want to. And so I think the parents need to really give themselves a break and feel good about themselves and their parenting. And I'm a firm believer, and I know you share this too, that we're at any given moment, whether we're talking about parenting or anything else, we're all doing the best we can with the resources we Absolutely. have, being you know, knowledge, patience, our mental health, our emotional health, our physical energy. Um, and if we, you know, it's not wrong to reach out for, for help or more information, but Absolutely. We're all doing the best we can in our circumstances. That's wonderful. I've mentioned before on here that I'm a recovering perfectionist, not recovered in any way. (laughs) Um, And so my good enough practice actually started with cleaning the house um, because I used to dedicate, like, I couldn't just do a quick cleanup. It had to be like this deep, it didn't start off that way, but it would always turn into a deep clean where I was scrubbing the floors and organizing drawers. And it was so time consuming. And then I would put it off because I didn't really want to do that. So it was actually working against me. Um, And as I went through therapy and got medicated, (laughs) and also my time just got a little tighter and my energy Mm -hmm. got a little tighter, I said, you know what? My goal for this clean is going to be a good enough clean. I am going to leave each room a little better than it was when I entered and I'm going to do it quickly. And it's just going to be good enough to get to the next time that I do a good enough cleaning. And that was so whatever the word is, I don't know, empowering for me. Um, So I would encourage parents that maybe are perfectionists and they struggle with this concept of good enough parenting, um, maybe just apply it somewhere else first where it wouldn't be (laughs) such a struggle um, and then try to apply it to your parenting. That might be sort of bringing, building in that rung that we need to get to the, the little win on the way to the big win. Um, Well, this was excellent. And I will say, I I just asked, can I just add one more thing? Sure. Uh, um, the cleaning thing. So I am not big into house cleaning. That's not a problem that I have. <laughs> and and so as a result, when I was home with my kids, when they were little, I tended to take them out a lot. Like I took them on a lot of outings. We were out all the time because I really just did not want to look at my house. Yeah. Um, and I asked my, so I've been asking my children now that I'm doing this parent coaching and putting myself out in a different way. I've asked, I've asked them about their recollections of their childhoods. And I, yeah, I've said, you know, do you ever, um, did it ever bother you that the house was messy? And they're like, no. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. They, it like, wasn't even a thing. It didn't know. even matter. No. So it did not have an impact on them. So, you know, that's not something that's really a parenting thing. Right. Exactly. Wonderful. Uh, this has been great. Thank you so much for your time, for your expertise. We will be back together and I will be back soon with more stuff that I and others wish that we knew sooner so you can learn it now. In the meantime, I'll leave you with my updated list of stuff that I've learned the hardest way. Uh, your to-do list will always be there. So put yourself on it, ideally towards the top, but on it. <laughs> you can pour from an empty cup. So schedule ways to refill yours every day. And As Dr. Stephanie told us, and I agree, there is no way to be a perfect parent. There are countless ways to be a really good one. So let's aim for that. Thank you so much, everybody, for listening and watching. And we'll be back soon. 